John graduate, graduated magna cum laude from University of Michigan and earned his Juris Doctor at Georgetown University Law School. John is a member of the Federalist Society, the National Association of Scholars, and the Distinguished Flying Cross Society. Our speaker served in Vietnam as, as an Army officer and gunship pilot and earned Distinguished Flying Cross Valor. That's one of that's the one they gave to Charles Lindbergh, and the cross of the gallantry with bronze star. The only medal that John received for the, for the date of his injury was the Purple Heart. Our speaker was recognized as Outstanding Disabled Veteran of the Year by the DAV at a ceremony with President Obama. John had written and passed a bill through Congress giving benefits for widows and orphans of disabled vets. His topic for us tonight is the Declaration of Independence. He will save time for questions and comments and encourages the same. So thank you. It's Independence Day. <laughs> and um, in truth, I prefer the term revolutionary because in 1776 and then on into George Washington's war, it was revolutionary in two meanings. First, yes, it was a bloody revolution fighting the existing government, Britain. But even more so, as we'll get into tonight, with the philosophy of government that they established, it was revolutionary in the history of mankind. So, and it is somewhat complicated, and uh, I've even written a limerick for the occasion. <laughs> Alas, some young students are perplexed and some older folks are likewise vexed when attempting to understand a mystery from a fact or point in history. But the answer is quite simple. It's context. So tonight, we're going to go back a couple hundred years. And in the beginning, we'll go back about 1,200. And my thesis, for tonight, and by the way, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, a student of mine from 20 years ago is here. Another young uh, student is here who just graduated this year. And uh, a lot of my uh, friends are here, so don't throw marshmallows. Um, and uh, we will have questions. We will not have fireworks. <laughs> We're going to keep this very scholarly, and uh, gentlemanly. So I used to be an officer and a gentleman, now I'm a gentleman and a scholar, so. And my wife is here, so she'll keep me in line. <laughs> now, the thesis is this. Yes, that was July in 1776 in Philadelphia. But the American Revolution really began in the 1500s in England. And I'm going to talk about that. And before I get to the 1500s, as you all know, the 800s came first. <laughs> and there was a major event in the year 1800. Strike, 800. Pope Leo III crowned King Charlemagne of France. And that began a thousand years for the development of Western civilization. During that time, Europe, from England to Russia, and everything between, was governed by <coughs> priests and princes, the Catholic Church, and monarchs. And that 
developed or that ran for a thousand years. And by the way, it was the cradle of Western civilization. Shakespeare, Tchaikovsky, Beethoven, Van Gogh, all the great literature and art developed. But in the 1500s, in England and in Germany, as you all know, Martin Luther, in about 1512 or so, began a bit of a revolution against the church. And in England, after the Bible had been published in 1475 by Mr. Gutenberg, people in England began to read the Bible and they said, uh, this doesn't sound like what we've got. And so beginning in about 1500, a group in England called, they called themselves the separatists. They were separating themselves from the Church of England, which had broken off from the Catholic Church with Henry VIII. You all know about that. But when they broke off, the Anglican community followed the model of the Roman Church a hierarchy. Instead of a pope, the English have the Archbishop of Canterbury. And indeed, for a hundred or so years, that relationship with the Tudor kings and the uh, Church of England, and again, the Church of England, meaning the only one, so these separatists said, we don't want to belong in that church. We're going to start our own. And of course, the kings and the Church of England didn't like that. And so by the 1600s, after maybe 50, 60 years of separation and persecution, and you all remember that Many immigrants from England came to the new country because of religious persecution. And by the 1640s, we begin the English Civil War. During that time, the Puritans mainly were joined by the Roundheads. And the Roundheads were Englishmen who worked with their hands. They were the poor people. In England in 1570 or so, Parliament passed the statute of wills, like your last will and testament. And they forbid a rich man to give his children the property upon his death. Only the firstborn son could get the money and the land and the title. Back then, of course, the average was 10 kids per family. <laughs> so upon the old man's death, we had nine poor people. <laughs> and in England at the time, about 7% of the people owned land, while 93% were landless and poor and really without rights. So when the New World was discovered, that is why we had such a great rush of Englishmen, because they came to America for land, to own land. And indeed, in my research, and by the way, I, I brought up just a copy of it. I've got, I read 10 big books and have an annotated bibliography, if anybody would like to look at that. Later on, I've got a handout on other issues, which we, I'll pass out to anybody who wants one. And I found in my research something that surprised me. 60% of the immigrants from England to the American colonies, 60% were indentured servants. Mm. And here's what that meant. By the way, as Don said, I'm a lawyer. Don't hold that against me. <laughs> but an indenture is a contract. Here's what would happen in the 16 and 1700s. 
there would be a ship in London or Liverpool or Plymouth, and they'd have a little plaque and it would say, sailing to America on such and such date. Hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of young, poor Englishmen, mainly men, but some women, would go down to the docks and talk to the captain, and they'd buy a one-way ticket to North America. And that was a contract. And here's, it was a piece of paper. And it said in exchange, well, it said, my business law students will know this, in consideration of my one-way ticket to North America, I will serve the holder of this piece of paper as his, as his servant, and him being my master for seven years. And by the way, until for about a hundred years, or yeah, about a hundred years, they worked pretty much like the later African American slaves. And they worked for seven years. But after that, by 1776, over half of them had achieved the American dream, and in 1776, three-fourths of the white Englishmen in the colonies owned their own land, while their cousins in England were still the 90% of landless poor people. That's why they came. And they were revolutionary in world history because they were self-governing. The king and parliament were six months away in England. They had not only to clear the land and plant their crops and build a life or a business, they had to govern themselves. And they were good Englishmen. And here's what happened in the English Civil War that preceded them and guided them in their lives. <coughs> the English Civil War lasted for a decade, the 1640s. It was a bloody revolution. 200,000 Englishmen died. That was a greater percentage than the English lost in World War I or World War II. Mm. This was a real bloodbath. And they both fought. And the king at the time was Charles I. And Charles I, as one of the historians I read, Lacey Baldwin Smith of Northwestern, he said, Charles I was a better martyr than a monarch. And indeed, that's true. Because when the rebels won the war, they beheaded the king. Later, they disestablished the Church of England. Remember, they were fighting against not only the hierarchical church, which they disagreed with, but they were fighting against the king. Because at that time, monarchs loved the doctrine of the divine right of kings. The uh, Northwestern scholar Lacey Baldwin Smith agrees with me when he said, the divine right of kings means this. It means the king is always right. And so they rebelled against that. Now, and again, they won. And there were really three separate major skirmishes. And finally, after the Puritans and Roundheads, the rebels won, there was a group within the model army, that was the rebel army, called the Levelers. That's not Phoenician blinds. <laughs> they, they were talking about leveling British society. And they met in 1647 at a church in Putney, England. 
and Oliver Cromwell, the leader, was there. And the levelers, common soldiers, some of them in blood-stained garm, garments, took over the meeting and made their demands. And for the first time in human history, people stood up and said, we should give our consent to the government. And the government should be just. And people should be treated equally. And there should be an independent legislature and an independent court system to protect our rights. And there should be religious freedom and freedom of speech. And for the first time in history, it turned out to be true. And those Englishmen were the grandfathers and great-grandfathers of all the millions who went to America. Now, the second big date in English history came in 1688-89, I guess over the Christmas break. <laughs> and, uh, here's what happened then. The Parliament had actually said in the in about uh, the seventies that you know we have all these castles, we have crown jewels and everything. And then a gentleman, the grandson of Charles the First, actually they put him on the throne, James the Second, and they told him to behave, but he didn't. And they had another little revolution called the Glorious Revolution, where when King James went to Europe on a little vacation, the people took over again. The parliament took over again. But they still thought to live in monarch-driven Europe, they needed a king and queen. So they went to Holland. They sent commissioners to Holland with a letter from Parliament to Prince William of Orange and his wife Mary. And, the, and they said, come to England. Be our king and queen. Re they literally, Parliament said, come to England and rescue her. Prince William came and he and his wife, who had royal blood, stood before Parliament and he only, he didn't even speak English, he spoke German. Here's what he said, listen carefully. We accept the gracious gift of the people and parliament of England. Now, I don't normally do this as my students, uh, John and uh, Camden will agree, I never do. <coughs> True or false questions, or fill in the blanks, but for you guys, I've got some. <laughs> so here's true or false, and I want you to think. In the 17th century, hint, hint, that's 1640s, 1688, 89, the English people blanked and blanked their king. I'll give you a hand. Both are five letters long. They rhyme. They have to do with employment law. Hired and fired, yes. They chopped off Charles the First hat. I'd, I'd call that the pink slip. Yeah. <laughs> and then with William and Mary, they sought them out and said, come to England, be our king. They hired them. Now here's another, this one's a true and false, and I think we'll get, and we need to rock this place. <laughs> true or false, in the 17th century in England, the people became the boss. True or false? And that's where those Englishmen came from, who went to America. The next year is the third big year in English history, 1690. 
And at that time, a gentleman named John Locke, L-O-C-K-E, wrote a little book, <coughs> The Second Treatise on Government. And when I was at Columbia, I had to read the whole dumb thing in that old language. <laughs> I'll translate it. <clears throat> John Locke said this, first of all, human beings have natural rights given by God. We'll get to them later. Second, he said, the English Civil War was terrific. The king had become a tyrant and he needed to be executed. The people needed to govern. And the glorious revolution where we hired William and Mary that was justified and good, too, in John Locke's mind. And by the way, the levelers had this great phrase. They said, in England, the poorest he should have the same rights as the richest he. Now, by the way, I'm sure you noticed that those egalitarian radical levelers didn't talk about the poorest or the richest she. They talked about he, men. Right now we're having this pronoun thing. Yeah, I'm a he, is, and believe me. And, and they were he people. Now, so John Locke wrote his second treatise that justified the revolution and the glorious and set forth natural rights. And then all close two and a half million of those Englishmen, two thirds of them indentured servants. Just imagine what that would be like. Would you get on a boat that sailed for five months to a brand new country that you'd never heard of, knew nothing about, would you take a one-way ticket, and when you got there, you'd be bought by a person, and you'd work like a slave for seven years. These people were serious about owning their own land. Now, now we'll skip ahead to those people. Again, about 90% or from the British Isles. A historian, a great historian of Dumas Malone, he wrote many books about Thomas Jefferson. He said this. In 18th century or 1776 America, any literate man had read two books, the Bible and the Second Treatise. And in both disciplines, they were the last words. If you had a religious question in America, you'd look in the Bible. Pretty good place to look. And if you had a government question, you'd look in John Locke's second treatise. Every literate man had read that book. And they believed it. And in that, book, John Locke said that our natural rights included life, liberty, and property. And when he talked about property, he mainly talked about a man who had a finite life, only a limited time to build his wealth, deserved every penny of it. That's what John Locke and Adam Smith talked about as property. And the Englishmen in America were proud of their heritage. Their great-great-grandfathers had fought in the 1640s. Their great-great-grandfathers had been part of the Glorious Revolution. They loved John Locke. And they were loyal Englishmen. They spoke the language. They used English money. 
They paid taxes without representation. They were Englishmen. Now our first show and tell will be the stripes, and my wife and a friend of mine, Mike, will show this flag. And I want you to look, of course, 13 stripes, but look in the canton. The Union Jack. These people were Englishmen. <coughs> they were loyal Englishmen. They loved England. This flag actually flew over George Washington's army that was uh, bivouac near Boston until June of 1776. And that's when they got the Betsy Ross, Colin Kaepernick flag. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, George. And the now we will get to the real the, the two revolutions. During about 150 years. 1604 to maybe 1650 or 60, the British left the colonists alone. So for about six or seven generations, these Englishmen, who only wanted land and freedom, built their own government. For the first time in human history, in all 13 colonies, in every little town, there was self-government. They voted by majority. They elected their leaders. And they came over doing it for 150 years. They came to like it. But in the 17, late 50s, 1760s, Britain needed more money, so they increased taxes, and they forced their products on the colonists. Anybody want to hear the truth about the Boston Tea Party? Yes. 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 The British had an economic system called mercantilism. Here's what it said. Colonists, English colonists, have two duties to ship raw materials back to England, and then buy processed, manufactured goods only from England. And for example, back then you know that when a family member died, those religious people wanted to wear black for a year. But many of them, many of these Americans, even though they were loyal to their deceased parents or so, did not want to buy a brand new suit of fine linen from England or a brand new black dress. That's where the term armband. They would take a scrap of black cloth and put it around their arm. And that was the black that they would wear. They wanted to rebel against high prices. Mercantilism is a monopoly. They could only buy English goods. There was one exception that the British allowed them to build. They couldn't build a factory to build plows or axes or guns or even needles or pins. They couldn't refine wool or cotton into cloth. They had to buy all that from England. And as you know, if you've got a monopoly, you charge high prices. Well, England had another colony at that time, India. And when the British got to England, they found that those people there, as the people in China, had a little weed called tea. And they would pick it and dry it up, I guess, and then put it in hot water and drink it. Well. The people in India, their raw material was tea. They sent it to England where it was processed and put into tea bags and those little cans with a picture of the queen like you see in Canada. <laughs> and then they, they notified the people in Boston and New York 
in 1774 and said, get ready, a shipload of tea is coming in. You gotta buy it. Well, the Americans had become great shipbuilders. That was the only thing they could do. In fact, half of the British fleet were ships made in America. <laughs> After becoming great shipbuilders, they became pretty good sailors. And they sailed to the Caribbean, where they found coffee. And of course, these smart Americans knew that coffee tastes a lot better than tea. <laughs> <laughs> and it was much cheaper. So when I love the New Yorkers. Later they had chutzpah. When the ship from England came full of tea, they sent out little boats and wouldn't even let the ship come to port. It did come to port in Boston, as you know. Then the Sons of Liberty threw it in the, in the harbor. That is why it was not only a rebellious act, but the reason they did it is they didn't want to buy tea at high prices. And that's what they were rebelling about. And now we come to a couple points. By 1775, throughout the colonies, they had sent chain letters, the leaders of every colony, or every, uh, yeah, then they were colonies, they would send a letter, it would go to everybody. Kind of like an email, reply all. <laughs> and, um, what they did is they tell what the evil British were doing. One of the things, and by the way, I don't know if you've ever read the Third Amendment about dragooning troops. Dragooning troops means this. Hey, homeowner. Here are two young men, hungry English soldiers. They're going to live in your house, and you're going to feed them indefinitely. That's what the British did. And some of the people, some of the, probably some of the wives, didn't, didn't like cooking for extra guys. And that went on in every colony, and they all moaned and groaned about it. So in 1775, they got together in Philadelphia, delegates from every colony. And for about a year, they just moaned and groaned and whined. But in June of 1776, a brave fellow named Richard Henry Lee, who was a granduncle of Robert E. Lee that we'll talk about later, he stood up and said, probably in our vernacular, he said, hey, let's get to the bottom line. Let's cut to the chase. You're all moaning and groaning. Let's vote to revolt from England, raise, spend a lot more money for George Washington's army, and have a revolution like our great-grandfathers did in England when they had a tyrannical king. And so the delegates all cheered, and he was the hero for a while. But then again, most of them were lawyers, and I'll admit that I am. And we love to write things. And so they said, we need a document. So they got a committee, Ben Franklin, Livingston, Sherman of Connecticut, John Adams, smart guy, and of course, Thomas Jefferson. And he set to work in mid-June, wrote a couple drafts of the Declaration. And then the committee would read them over. And at one point, he had a long, very long paragraph about all the evil things the English were doing. In fact, if you look at the Declaration of Independence, don't do it now. <laughs> Two-thirds of it are called the long train of abuses. Jefferson was a wordsmith. 
What he's saying is, these are the evils that King George and the British are doing to us. That's two-thirds of the, of the document. And in there, he denounced the British for slavery. He called it a tyranny of nature, even though he owned slaves himself. But he was complex enough to think of it in both ways. It's evil, but I really need him. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but the committee said, hey, Tom, remember half the people here own slaves. Are, they're not going to buy that. Let's X that out. So they deleted it. But he did take a stand. And indeed, as we'll get into the philosophy, remember John Lobb's three natural rights. Life, liberty, and property. Later I'll tell you what happened to that word from Thomas Jefferson. Now, anybody have any comments or questions so far? And please say your name. I've got one rule on questions. Don't make a speech about a website you saw yesterday or what you heard on CNN, okay? Ask a question if you're unsure of something I've said in this line of baloney. Though. John. So my question is, so the Revolutionary War started in 1775 in March with the Battle of... Um, yeah, but so it wasn't so, declared yet. Okay, so, so they were still kind of grumbling and things at this time. John. Oh, so they were still kind of grumbling and things at this time and, and hadn't declared war? Well, they, what they did in the, and I'll get to that, it was one of Thomas Jefferson's major purposes. So that brings me right to it. Anybody else have a question? Remember George Washington had an army in Boston, and there, were, there was Lexington Concord happened before. But in the Declaration, and I'll get to that right now, Jefferson was a lawyer and a great writer and a great thinker. And with the Declaration, and I owe this to my graduate professor at Michigan, who really drummed this into our heads, Jefferson had three purposes. First, to sever the bonds of allegiance with England in writing and officially in order to declare the United States as a sovereign nation. A sovereign nation, defined by Abraham Lincoln, who's pretty good worse than himself, is this. A sovereign nation has no legal or political superior. So right now, think of uh, uh, Belize in Central America. At the UN, there's the United States, Russia, Communist China, and Belize. They're all equal, because Belize is a sovereign country. And the purpose of doing that now to John's question, is basically to say this, we are your equal, and we're going to revolt from you. Because at the time, the European communities, as you know, they were all having all kinds of wars, the Seven Year War, the One Hundred Year War, you know, all that stuff. They had a convention like they were playing a board game. If country A wanted to have a war with country B, country C, D, E, F, G, H would all have to say, we're with A, or we're with B, or we're neutral. And they had another rule. No country could inveigle itself or take sides or get involved in the internal affairs of another country. So Thomas Jefferson had a purpose legally. See, Declaration of Independence, it's philosophy, it's history, it's also the law. 
And he wanted to fulfill international law at the time. So he said, we're not a bunch of colonies anymore. We are a nation. We are equal to England, France, and everybody else over there. Any comments or questions on that? It's very important. We did have a question. Yes, who's that? Yeah, uh, Mr. Todd, this is John Panzica. How you doing? And um, I just had a point of clarification. I don't want to take us off topic or anything, but you had mentioned that um, when the indentured serv servants came over, they had seven-year commitment. And you said that went on for 100 years, roughly? Every year there were new sevens. Oh, OK, gotcha. Yeah. OK. Yeah, a person didn't have to work for 100 years. They were just, <laughs> would you say the slavery yeah, was? Except me, I'm still working. <laughs> would you say that slavery in those days were what we would think of like slavery? Uh, we're going to get to that. OK, all right. I promise. OK, no problem. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, who's up? Yeah, and what is your name? This is Dwayne, John. OK. Um, you, you alluded to it, and, and I'm missing something in my history. When did we officially become the United States of America? Actually, I'm going to get to this later. The Declaration of Independence said so. OK. But in truth, it was really about 1780. And I'm going to talk, at the end, I'm going to tell you some more about that. What they, they had their first continental government. Their document was called the Articles of Confederation. And, boy, Dwayne, that's a good question. Thank you. And here is what it said. Remember, there were 13 colonies. Mm -hmm. And remember, those Englishmen were proud Republicans and Democrats and they loved their own government. When they united, and by the way, Dwayne brings up a good point, because again, they declare independence in 76. They, it takes four years of arguing and politics before they really establish a government. And the most important sentence, it's the first sentence in this alleged document of the United States, it says this. Each state shall retain full freedom, sovereignty, and independence. Now, here's a thought question. Who were they declaring independence from in the Articles of Confederation to create the United States? Yeah. Him. Right. The Not States. England. No. <laughs> they were declaring, each state was declaring independence from the U.S. government. Yes. <clears throat> they said each state is sovereign. By the way, a great story I just read about. <clears throat> During war, George Washington met with a company of, of soldiers from New Jersey. I said, OK, guys, uh, why don't you take an oath uh, to the United States? I said, baloney, we're from the country of New Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll fight with you, but we're from New Jersey. They literally said the country, and that's how the states thought of themselves. And by the way, just to preempt uh, the, uh, the end of the discussion, they allowed each state to make their own laws, and each state or each, each colony didn't veto those laws. So relevant to what we'll talk about later with regard to slavery, the Deep South states, or deep, the Virginia, North and South Carolina, Georgia, uh, back then they were the only ones, <clears throat> they were slave states, and they made laws that said slavery is legal. The New England and Northern states said, we'll make our laws. We say it's illegal. We abolish it. <laughs> and by the way, the first governments in the world to abolish slavery were Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. The first governments to abolish slavery. 
Okay. Now, back to the other two purposes. Purpose one. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Was that a question? Yeah. Okay. First purpose was to establish a nation, a sovereign nation. The second purpose, as Thomas Jefferson put it, was to explain why they were doing it, explain their philosophy. And finally, number three, it was an advertisement and propaganda to recruit soldiers. That is why two-thirds of the declaration are, is an allegation of tyranny by the British. In 1776, the country was split in three. One-third of the people wanted revolution. One-third favored the British. People in the middle didn't care. So here these men are in Philadelphia. George Washington's out there ready to fight the, the world's superpower, and he's only got one-third of his people behind him. Wow. We need to recruit some people. We need to make some people mad. And that's what Jefferson was doing in the long train of abuses. Mm -hmm. Those are the three purposes. Wow. Now we'll get to the exact language, unless there's another question. Everybody got the three, I think. Okay. Those will be on the test. <laughs> <laughs> he starts out with this, and it's very important, especially for religious people today. When in the course of human events, that's how he starts, it becomes necessary for one people to sever the bonds of allegiance with another, meaning America and England, with respect to humanity, we need to explain our reasons. And then he said this, and you probably heard this. We're going to look at our self-evident truths. That's how he begins. And by the way, think about it. By the way, I hate, with, I know there are husbands and wives here, <clears throat> but, uh, but at least I'll give you both the tactic. The next time you have a discussion with someone, start the discussion this way. Everything I say is true and obvious. Oh, now what do you have <laughs> That's what Jefferson said. Right. We hold these truths, everything I say is true, and it's self-evident or obvious. And by the way, he was throwing it in the face of the British. The British had taught them about natural rights. The English had taught them about <clears throat> overthrowing the government. The English had taught them about hiring a king and consent of the government. So it's kind of like, uh, don't raise your hand, I know we have parents and grandparents here, but, and it happened to me, and it happened to my wife and me, sometimes we tell our daughters something, and they'd say, but dad, you always said to do such and such. <laughs> so it's ironic, it's like saying, hey, Englishman, you taught us well. <laughs> if you have a bad government, you can overthrow. They were throwing, he was throwing it in their face. And he put it so well. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Okay. Now, here we come to the philosophy. That all men are created equal. <clears throat> now, by the way, earlier, in the second sentence, he mentions nature's law and nature's God. He believed, and John Locke believed, this was their philosophy, that God created the world and people, and 
a human being when he was born, or she, had rights. And let's say for religious Christian or Christian people, you know that we have a soul. And we got the soul when we were born. And on an anatomy chart, you can't find one. Nor can you find the rights that Jefferson said we had and John Locke said. So that's, that is the nature, that's the nature's God and natural law. And that came from the Enlightenment. Now, it's perfectly consistent with our version, if you're a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim, I suppose, to think about a, a God and his creation. Jefferson just didn't want to worship that God. He wanted, he loved the natural rights, and that was the creator, and we are created with natural rights. Now that's kind of a big thought. Any comments, questions on that? But it's true, it's in there. Nature's law, nature's God. Not Jehovah God. Not uh, Muhammad's God. Not Allah. Not Yahweh, the Jews, Jewish God. Okay. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Now, this is the big controversy. And I want to look at that, at that one little word, three letters, men. Thomas Jefferson was a lawyer. And there is a Latin phrase that lawyers use and I'll spout it, and then you'll say, wow, he knows Latin. <laughs> Expressio unius est exclusio ulterior. Meaning, to say one, specifically, excludes the others. Thomas Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence. When he said men, he meant males. And actually, he meant certain kinds of males. He meant white Englishmen were equal to the white Englishman, King George. Mm. They put their boxer shorts on the same way. <laughs> and that's what he was talking about. Remember, he had a purpose to justify the revolution, to declare the United States a sovereign, to uh, recruit warriors. He wasn't writing a piece of philosophy. He was saying to the King of England, we're white Englishmen and we are equal to you. He was not talking about women which he excluded, as you know. They were all male chauvinist pigs back then. <laughs> and he wasn't talking about African slaves. <coughs> he wasn't talking about them. Okay. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator. Yes, he believed in a creator, natural God, nature's God with unalienable rights. Oh, that's a great word. It is the only word in the Declaration that is a legalistic word. It comes from English common law. The verb is to alienate, and here's what it means. Let's say I sold my house to Mr. Buyer. I'd sign a deed and that would alienate my land title to Ms. Meyer. And so think of what that means. We are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Meaning that, yeah, person's born, he's got rights, can't sell them. 
can't give them away. You can't trade them. Okay. Uh, again, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Remember John Locke. Jefferson loved John Locke. Do Mom alone and uh, Joseph Ellis, professors I've read. They say that Jefferson's little book of John Locke was well worn. He read it many, many times. He loved it. But remember, they, they wouldn't let him condemn slavery. And so he traded the word property for pursuit of happiness. Now, this is my humble opinion. He did that for two reasons. First of all, he wasn't a communist. He wasn't rejecting property. Remember, he was a rich guy. He had two mansions, Monticello on a $5 bill, and his other mansion didn't make it to any dollar bill. But he owned two mansions, 100 or more slaves. He was a rich guy. He was a lawyer. He went to court fighting for property rights, his own and his client. So he wasn't rejecting property. But he was a little mad at those people that made him take condemnation of slavery out. And at the time, in the colonies, pursuit of happiness was a very big phrase. In fact, George Mason, who wrote the uh, Virginia De Declaration of Rights, included pursuit of happiness. Other states had it in their constitution. But the most important reason that I've always glommed on to is it was a rhetorical flourish. Remember, the Declaration would be read aloud in the town square. So I'm reading it. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and property. How about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Anybody want to pursue happiness? <laughs> Okay, that's why I did it. Now, and let me check the time. Ooh, better get going. Um, the next part of the philosophy is this. Said, and listen carefully. Governments are instituted by men. Now, if anyone had a Bible, you could go to Romans 13, and the Apostle St. Paul said this, governments are instituted by God. Thomas Jefferson, the man from the Enlightenment, the man of natural rights, is having a revolution. And he's saying, no, we don't need the Pope or the Archbishop or God to create our government. We're going to do it. And he wasn't afraid to make that statement. Now, a lot of the people, I think at the time, didn't really get it because they weren't that deep into it. They just said, yeah, we're going to fight the British. OK, this is Thomas, this great document you got here. But he made it that a point. Men with their brains would make the government. They didn't need God to do it. Now, God gave us rights. One of the rights was to create our government with our brains, with our reason. All right. That governments are instituted among men deriving their power, their just powers, from the consent of the governed. And that's what all the colonies have done for 150 years, 170 years. The people voted for their government. Mm -hmm. Then he said this, and if a government becomes oppressive or tyrannical 
people have the right to alter or abolish it. The people have a right to change them. The people have the right to abolish or destroy their government and build a new one with their brains. And that's the revolutionary part of his declaration, not only in a bloody revolution, but for the first time in human history, people built a nation from the consent of the governed, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Now, he concluded the declaration with we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. During the Revolutionary War, the British were pretty nasty. They assassinated a lot of the leaders. They put tens of thousands of Americans in brutal jails. They burned large estates. But they did not sacrifice their sacred honor. Now, any comments or questions on the Declaration? Then I've got one more topic. Okay. And tell me your name. And Dr. Cod, this is uh, this is John Rock, um, a former student of mine. He's really smart. <laughs> um, I have one question, and I'm not trying to uh, get us off track, but you had mentioned earlier that the states were their own sovereign sovereignty, right? So they're yep. like their own countries. Yep. Was there a definitive time in history when they yep. became... When it changed? Yes. I'll tell you in a minute. Okay. Wait Good a question. <laughs> right. Now, <clears throat> we celebrate the beginning of the United States on July 4th, 1776. Is that correct? <laughs> we do that here in Oxford Charter Township. <laughs> The New York Times told me recently that the nation was born in 1619. <laughs> Didn't jive with my history. By the way, again, I have a 10 big books to talk about it. I want to talk about that right now. That particular, it was a magazine article, and it said that the United States began when a Portuguese ship brought about 25 slaves to Virginia. Historian Alan Brinkley of Columbia University told this account. When those 28 men were brought, and they were auctioned off, the colonists treated them like indentured servants and gave them their freedom after seven years. <laughs> Only later, maybe 100 years, in the southern states, with the cultivation of cotton, tobacco, rice, and indigo. By the way, I finally found out what indigo was. It's a blue dye that they wanted to plant. They found that since they didn't have any John Deere tractors, farming was a lot of work. <laughs> so back to John's questions, yes. After we won the war, and then after we'd established the Constitution, that's another lecture, the southern states said slavery is legal. They had the power to do that. The northern states abolished slavery. When they established the Articles of Confederation, their first Constitution, they, they agreed they battled about slavery, but finally they had to agree. They said, we, we can't get rid of those southern states. We need them. And the same was true of the Constitution. But the truth of the matter is, between 1776 and then in 1789, when the Constitution was adopted, up until the Civil War, North and South and the Midwest debated every day about whether to abolish slavery. Mm -hmm. There is no way to say that the nation was built on slavery. It was, if anything, the, the arguments, remember Lincoln said four score and seven years ago, 
87 years. For 87 years, north and south, abolitionists, free soilers, and slaveholders, that was the big political debate, among other things. It wasn't the end all, it wasn't the most, maybe not the most important thing for most people, but in truth, they debated and argued about it. And then, as you know, in 1861, they had a war about it. Now, I recently heard an interview about the 1690 project by a law professor. And he was waxing eloquent. He was really joyful that last year, in June, a mob in New Orleans tore down the statue of Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis. And that, for him, was, oh, that was a big, that was great. You know, he forgot to say that between 1861 and 1865, two and a half million white Northern Union soldiers defeated Robert E. Lee on the battlefield and tracked down Jefferson Davis wearing a dress and put him in house arrest. And in the 14th Amendment, punished leaders of the Confederacy. I think that is so ironic and so missing the point. Finally, if you've been listening to the news, and I, I recently read a couple books, and believe me, they were tough to understand. And the, the theory is called critical race theory. It's a legal theory. Born in law schools, fortunately, when I got there, they didn't teach it to me. I think it was right in the beginning. I mean, here's what it was. If you all remember history, you've probably heard of these cases. In 1896, Plessy v. Ferguson, about segregated railroad cars. In 1896, the Supreme Court of the United States actually misread the 14th Amendment and said separate but equal was constitutional. There was one dissenter, John Marshall Harlan, and he said this in his dissent. The Constitution is colorblind. So for about 50, 60 years, the legal theory was colorblindness. If there was a civil rights case of uh, people of color being discriminated against, the legal theory was to be colorblind. And when Plessy v. Ferguson was overruled in 1954, and there were two, count them two, Brown versus Board of Education cases, the Supreme Court said separate but equal is never equal. And so the new theory was that with racial cases, we treat all people equally. Well, a couple law professors began to say, that's not good enough for us. Colorblind and equality, we want more than that. And so they came up with critical race theory. By the way, it took a long time in reading their own books for me to figure that out, because in the media, maybe, I don't know, maybe you've seen or heard on radio or TV, I, I've heard people on NPR, I, uh, NPR, I'm sorry, uh, the, the reporter says, uh, well, Professor so-and-so, describe critical race theory, then he just talks about oh, racial discrimination, like if, uh, if you go to the 7-Eleven and the clerk doesn't smile at you, well, that's racial, that's prejudice. So what they're doing now is they're pushing the Project 1619. Yeah. They're rejecting Jefferson's great document. They're rejecting our history. And they're putting it in this term, not equality, but equity. Mm -hmm. 
Equity is a legal phrase that means, basically means fairness. So they say, because of slavery, we need more than equal. We need more fairness. Now, I know this is controversial, and I've treated it in a scholarly way. I haven't thrown firebombs at anybody. We'll have fireworks later on the 4th, <laughs> uh, but not now. And if you have a question, again, I compliment everybody. Everybody who asked a question had a real question. They didn't make a speech. They didn't tell me about a website they read last week. If you have a question on 1619 and or critical race theory, I'll be happy to try it. And by the way, I have a handout, copy 50 of them, that have scholarly backup of what I said about all these issues that I'll be happy to pass on. Any questions on the 1619 project or critical race theory? Um, uh, I've got uh, this Mike Kershot. Okay. And um, I have a question, uh, not, not about critical race theory, but you mentioned that um, the Declaration of Independence, when it says men, that he meant white English men. That's what I said. But what about the, uh, the other Europeans, uh, such as the French, and I'm sure there were Dutch, Oh, there well, were those people here at the time. Did, there were some Jewish people. There were some Dutchmen, some Germans, yeah. probably some Spanish. If they were white, I suppose they'd be included. I was making the point primarily 90% were white Englishmen, and the king is a white Englishman. We are equal to him. I, I suppose you could argue if we had a guy from uh, Holland was Caucasian, he'd be included. Okay. So that's uh, yeah. all I can say. Anybody else? Doesn't, oh. Okay, gang. Uh, yeah, by the way, we I- We do have one more question. Oh. Sorry. I think, I think it's on. Thank you. Yes, hi. I don't want to make this over simplistic, but I'm just curious yeah, to know- Who are you? Oh, I'm sorry. This is John Panzeca. And I, I, again, I don't want to make this oversimplified or put you on the spot, but I'm just wondering, what do you think is behind all the misinformation and all the abuse of disregard for history? And I, I just wondered, is there a, I, I you know, not in a conspiratorial way, but I mean, is there anything that you can put a finger on? Um, Why we're so I, I don't want to touch that because again, you. There's a lot of conspiracy theories. All I know is this. As I was saying, many, many black law professors, oh, and by the way, one of them claimed that Brown v. Board of Education uh, was more for white people than for black people. <laughs> and they, they criticized it. Mm -hmm. So they criticized the great case <clears throat> for equality and, and not separate but equal. Um, I will give you this hint. In 12 days, Mark Levin has a book that will answer your question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I won't. OK, thank you. <laughs> because I want to keep things very civil for our host. <laughs> Any other questions? OK, let's have a round of applause for our host.